first panel today, the way we do this is we call this the state of play panel, where these panelists are real superstars in the industry. Let's just hear whatever they want to talk about. So their topics aren't limited. Let's get to their introductions, and then you can start listening to them, start asking questions, start chatting amongst yourselves. Uh, very exciting day ahead. Our moderator for this panel is an IR masterclass uh, veteran. His name is Chris Swalina. And what Chris's bio will tell you is that he is the global co-head of Norton Rose Fulbright's Data Protection, Privacy, and Cybersecurity Group and has unique experience handling complex cybersecurity attack and data breach investigations. But what you might have missed from Chris's bio is that Chris went from being a great client to being a great law firm partner. Having begun his career in privacy as vice president and assistant general counsel at Choice Point, where he ran the company's privacy, compliance, ethics, credentialing department. He's also worked in-house at Dow Chemical and at Bayer. He's perfect for this panel because he does for other teams what he did for his own team, which is to excel during the life cycle of a data breach. First as a coach to get you through it, as a counselor to lead the response to regulatory, even criminal inquiries, and finally as an advocate to manage all the lit litigation. In IR circles, Chris is known best as the equalizer, both the, the TV and the movie versions. And if Chris had a theme song, it would be Walk This Way by Aerosmith, uh, actually the Aerosmith and Run DMC version, because when Chris asks his clients to walk his way, they do it. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, John, appreciate that. Next up. <laughs> yeah. Next up, we have Jennifer Coughlin of Mullen Coughlin. Most of the lawyers who speak here today are also entrepreneurs because they've created a practice area that has only recently experienced its genesis. But only a few of the lawyers today have taken that notion of entrepreneurism to its highest level. Jennifer Coughlin, a partner and the founder of Mullen Coughlin, is one of the few, one of those few, creating a law firm in 2016, less than a decade ago exclusively dedicated to cyber from the ground up. And now it's a global IR powerhouse boasting 117 attorneys, a lot more employees, and they're even expanding overseas. What makes Jennifer a cyber expert is not just her extraordinary experience providing first party breach response and third party privacy defense legal services, but it's also that she's typically the smartest person in the room wherever she goes. She's an extraordinary success and should be an inspiration for any of the newer practitioners who are out there in the field of just how far good hard work and expertise can take you. Uh, she's not only the Madame Curie of IR because she is the kind of trailblazer who not only thinks uh, brilliantly, but also differently. She's also the Ronda Rousey of IR because if Jennifer had a theme song, it would be Hit Me With Your Best Shot by Pat Benatar. Welcome, Jennifer. So glad you could be on this panel. Great, thanks, John. Next up is Travis LeBlanc, chair of Cooley's Cyber Data Privacy Practice, who really thrives amid the juxtaposition of cyber technology, law, and business. What you'll immediately note from Travis's bio is his extraordinary level of government experience. You'll see this throughout today. He was chief of the FCC's Enforcement Bureau during the Obama administration, a lawyer in the California AG's office, where at the direction of then California AG Kamala Harris, launched California's statewide privacy enforcement and protection unit, as well as the California e-crime unit. You'll also note that Travis is one of the few people on the planet, not just of today, who has degrees from Yale, Princeton, Harvard, and Cambridge. Um, so annoying, Travis. But what you may miss is that the U.S. Senate unanimously confirmed Travis twice when he was nominated to the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board by former President Trump and President Biden which advises on the review and the federal government's counterterrorism activities to safeguard privacy and civil liberties. The only question that remains, and I ask this every year, is when will we see Travis stepping onto Air Force One? I have had the privilege of working with Travis on a few matters, and his brilliance is only outdone by his humility. Travis is the LeBron James of IR, and if Travis had a theme song, it would be Don't Stop Believing by Journey, because Travis's personal brand of optimism and enthusiasm mixed with affability is, and, and the toughness of the Sopranos truly makes him one of a kind. So welcome, Travis. So glad you could be here. Thank you, John. And look, I'm looking forward to the day when you select Nelly's Air Force One as my theme song, or even better, you won't have to wait much longer. I know you're a sneaker head. I don't know if we can see any of them uh, behind you right now, but I can step on the Air Force Ones later this afternoon if you'd like. <laughs> 
Thank you, Travis. Excellent. Excellent. Um, okay, last up, but not least, is Evan Roberts of uh, FTI Consulting. He's a senior managing director in the strategic communication segments at FTI Consulting and co-head of cybersecurity and data privacy communications. So this is what Evan represents is really a new brand of communication specialists, a new brand of crisis management, because all Evan does is cyber incidents. And this makes for a very busy and high energy professional life. It's very intense doing cyber because you get the call and the next thing you know, your life is turned upside down. Even though it didn't happen to you, it's just that you're helping somebody get through it. Evan advised an energy company deemed critical infrastructure through a devastating ransomware attack that temp temporarily shut down a pipeline providing nearly half of all the fuel to the U.S. and East Coast, counseling a large insurance provider through an unprecedented ransomware attack and associated network disruption, a Fortune 200 technology company in the development and implementation of the cybersecurity preparedness plan, and just hundreds of other companies. He is a master crisis manager, a veteran fixer. Fixer. He is the Harvey Keitel of IR. And if Evan had a theme song, it would have to be Shake It Off by Taylor Swift, because that's what Evan's special brand of crisis management is all about, getting through it. So welcome, Evan. And uh, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, because I was just going to say, like, you could, if you wanted to have fun, you could imagine us all in those outfits of those performers in those videos. Uh, if anybody saw or remembers uh, Steve, what Steven Tyler wore with Run DMC, uh, Pat Benatar, Steve Perry. But then I think, uh, you know, if you think of those videos and what those folks were wearing, but then I think the best is imagine Evan dressed as Taylor Swift. <laughs> Evan is Taylor. The that's best. The, oh, God, I have so much to live up to. That's the, that's the, be that's the best one. Uh, so, um, no, I have a, uh, 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 privilege of, of moderating this, this all-star cast and, and, and we're here to talk about the state of play, uh, broken it up just to, to help set the stage for later today. We're going to talk about threat actor landscape, uh, talk about some developments in regulatory, uh, space, and then, and then talk about what I think is a really important topic and that's, uh, governance. And of course, we'll talk about some other things too. Um, you know, 2024 uh, has been uh, pretty quiet, so not much of us have been, uh, you know, we've been pretty much on the bench all, all year long. Um, uh, no, it's been, you know, 2023 was crazy. 2024 seems to be off uh, to an even crazier uh, start. Um, what we see is that, uh, again, no one is immune from getting hit by these uh, actors, whether it be APT groups or the financially motivated uh, um, uh, e-criminals. Um, the companies that we represent, um, these are companies where security was not an afterthought. Um, uh, security programs are mature, uh, sophisticated, tools are in place, monitoring detection capabilities in place, um, risk management and governance in place, all to some greater or lesser extent in some time, in, in some cases. But, you know, by and large, I think what you would hear from the experts on this panel is that uh, no company is immune to to this risk. That goes from the FIs who spend tons of money on cyber all the way to the uh, smaller uh, companies. The ransom actors are still lying around. Um, uh, the, their, their activities it continues to increase. They, they are aware of the weak points in organizations. They continue to exploit them. Uh, concerningly, they increase their level of sophistication. Uh, they continue to get better at what they do. Uh, a lot of these uh, e-crime actors are uh, uh, quieter uh, than they than they used to be. They wait longer uh, once they get in, working with access brokers uh, who give them the point of entry, and then coming in and 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 waiting longer to 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 uh, execute the kill chain. Um, we also see the louder guys too. So it is a it is it is a mixed bag in the shorter time frames. But 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 what's concerning to me anyway is that the uh, a lot of the e-crime actors are becoming more and more uh, sophisticated. This all translates to more challenge uh, to companies. Uh, so the landscape is getting getting um, um, uh, more and more uh, uh, challenging. Then you couple that with the regulatory um, uh, scrutiny and increase. We see the SEC ramping up enforcement, new rules from the SEC. Um, uh, that's an interesting topic for, you know, for, for uh, a much longer discussion, how companies are sort of reacting to that. We've seen a lot of sort of what, we, what seems to be knee-jerk reactions to filings, um, mistakes made in filings. Um, uh, we also see CISOs 
being very concerned. Uh, I know the folks on this call, Jen and Travis, I'm sure you've got as many calls as I have from CISOs asking if they need to get their own lawyers. Um, uh, we see that now quite a bit. I think CISOs historically and generally speaking, a lot of our CISO clients are great at this, but a lot also struggle at conveying to boards and conveying to management um, not only the progress of the program and where they are, I think CISOs generally do really well at that. I think where they have more difficulty is really conveying risk, uh, what real risk is and how to, how to quantify that. I think that's a challenge. I think we're seeing a lot of focus on that. Um, we've seen coordinated law enforcement action, increased media focus. We've got major headlines, national, um, uh, you know, 60 Minutes running a segment recently, the the healthcare national impact uh, that we've just seen with a, a major ransomware attack. So lots and lots uh, going on um, and lots to talk about. So with that, let's get our conversation going to focus on a little bit more detail so you can hear some examples of threat actor landscape. And let's talk about some of the actors that have made a big splash in, in uh, 2023 and 2024. We've got uh, no shortage of actors to pick from, Scattered Spider, uh, Lockbit, of course, uh, uh, Black Hat. Um, so let's 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 talk about what you're seeing, um, Jennifer. Uh, let Let's start with you. Sure. So uh, we at Mullen Coughlin are seeing a, a spike, obviously, in incident incident response matters. Echoing what you just said, extrapolating out what we've seen in Q1 of this year, we are surpassing what we've seen in prior years. Uh, 2023 was difficult. 2021 was very difficult. Uh, we are on track to see more matters than those very difficult years. And the types of matters that we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of ransomware matters. We're seeing a lot of uh, matters relating to vendor risk, you know, change healthcare. We've got a lot of organizations impacted as a result of their relationship with change. We're seeing a lot of business email compromises. But ransomware still is a massive threat to every organization out there. And what we're seeing as you said, organizations are more sophisticated, their privacy programs are more sophisticated, their security more sophisticated, there's more investment in it. The threat actors are more, sophistica more sophisticated. They're investing in their own effort. They're, they're doing what they can to continue to successfully attack organizations and extort monetary payments uh, from these organizations. And we've seen them uh, evolve their tactics and become much more aggressive. Uh, we're seeing many more instances of threat actors uh, installing back doors and having real footholds in the organization. So containment is a question mark that seems to linger longer than it used to in years prior when responding to ransomware events. We're seeing uh, threats of swatting and physical harm towards individuals at the organization and their families, which just really brings back the fear that when around 2018, 2019, when we started seeing the threat actors threatening to post data on the dark web, there was all of a sudden this element of fear that was being considered as part of the do we, do we not pay ransom uh, discussion that our clients were having. So now it's extending to threats of harm and, uh, and injury to family members of, of organization team members. Um, we're seeing threat actors contact individuals whose information they may have taken. So if they launched an attack against a healthcare organization and they have patient data and the healthcare organization says we're not paying, we're seeing the threat actors reach out to the patients saying, do you know we have your data? We'll tell you what we have and how we got it, and what you can do about it and what somebody else isn't doing about it. So they're just becoming much more aggressive and it's putting organizations in an already tough spot um, when deciding exactly how they're going to respond to the ransomware event. Before I turn to you, I should have said to everybody, I hope, uh, I hope um, uh, folks will put in questions uh, to us. I, I know this panel here, we, we've got a few topics we want to talk about. But um, uh, we would love to take questions. Um, I know this panel would be ready to hit anything that you have to ask. Travis, what are you seeing? Thanks, Chris. Um, at Cooley, we are seeing um, essentially everything that you described, everything that Jen described. So I don't, I'm not going to repeat that. Um, there is no question that the threat actors are becoming more sophisticated in their extortion efforts, not just in terms of the methods that they are using for outreach, but also in terms of the technology that they're using. And so the, 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 the latest change in the last year that I wanted to highlight is the use of AI to advance their efforts. And so- Travis, for that, was, 
Travis, that was one of the questions that just came in, which was, you know, what, how do you, so you're hitting it, which is how- Did Travis AI, submit that question? Yeah, maybe he submitted it to himself, but, but, but yeah, talk about AI and how you think, because, you know, how it's going to make it more challenging. Yeah, so, so we've seen it in two ways thus far. Um, Dave Nevada and I were working on a matter of uh, six months ago or so, in which I am very convinced that the threat actor that we were communicating with was a bot. Very convinced that it was a bot. That no longer is it a, um, a human on the other end that you're necessarily computing with, that could, um, communicating with. They had set up a bot, and that's who we were finding ourselves negotiating with. Now, obviously, the bot was getting some instructions from elsewhere, but it certainly allows you to scale a lot more if each of these negotiations, if you can set up different bots to negotiate, uh, negotiate with. I will also tell you, it is an extremely frustrating negotiation. Imagine if you had to negotiate with the likes of Chat GPT or another uh, large, you know, large LM. Like it says things to you that just don't make sense. And you know, for those of us that have dealt with the teenagers that were, you know, that we had to negotiate with and the craziness of negotiating with them and when they sleep and when they need to go. And, and then they have arguments and disputes with each other. Let me assure you, negotiating with a bot right now with a chat bot is actually way more challenging. So we've seen it um, um, uh, with bots. The other place that we're seeing it is in the use of deep fakes. So there's a pretty famous example um, from, from earlier this year of a Hong Kong company in which, uh, unfortunately, one of the finance uh, employees wired $25 million uh, after doing a video conference call with several other employees of the company, including the CFO. And it turned out all of them were generative AI. The voices were fake. The video was fake. That is the landscape that we're in. Another example, just this week, LastPass post an incident in which uh, someone uh, generated a the fake uh, audio, the fake voice of the CEO of the company in an effort to dupe an employee into wiring money somewhere. Fortunately, in that instance, it didn't work. But this obviously changes the way that we have to approach all of these issues because it's not necessarily human, they are not necessarily rational, and they are not necessarily motivated uh, solely by money once we are in this, this, this gen AI threat landscape. Many of us last year were waiting for this. We had heard about how AI was being used to generate malware. And, and, and that we've, we've already started to see. But we're now into a new world where you can't necessarily trust any of the fallbacks that we use, audio, video, um, other, other means of communication. No longer is that purely sacrosanct. Yeah, I, 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 great points all. I think, you know, uh, uh, AI is going to make it all challenging, uh, more challenging for cybersecurity professionals. When you're focused on identity as one of our main defenses and now you turn that on its head it's going to be a challenge uh to the taylor swift of communications um what uh what are you seeing my friend yeah i mean i think the and and both jen and travis and you chris alluded to this the thing that most stuck out to me over the past year and then the early part of 2024 is the increased personal aggression from threat actors. And I think a lot of that is coming from the fact that your sort of typical playbook, smash and grab, grab a bunch of HR files with a bunch of socials for a bunch of current and former employees, it doesn't really work when you're looking to extort companies and get payment. Everybody has gotten so many notice letters at this point that that pressure in and of itself is being increasingly less effective for threat actors. And so where do they turn? They turn in a lot of different directions, and my fellow panelists have touched on them. But just making things unbelievably personally uncomfortable for victims to the point where it's just, I need to make this stop, and I'll make a payment to make it stop. And and really in ways in the last year that I saw that, um, I mean, having done this for a number of years and seen hundreds of incidents, I'm always surprised that I'm ever surprised. Um, but death threats to people's houses sim swapping and taking personal photographs and putting them on the dark web, targeting executives' children, the th threat of swatting. I and mean, we had a CISO put his dog in boarding because swatting was a real threat. And one of the first things that police do is respond to aggressive animals. And so it's complicated the communications landscape 
Because traditionally we would say, oh, you know, you're not at greater risk of identity theft because of this. Underlying that is your social is already available to anybody who wants it. But now it's sort of how do you reassure people they're physically safe and that an actor that may be thousands of miles away from them can't actually threaten their lives and threaten their livelihood. And so it's really added an urgency to the communications from from my perspective and our perspective. And it's really created a challenge. It's made these things feel like less of the run of the mill. This is what every business has to go through. And it's truly testing the metal of executives at these organizations. And it comes down to personality in a lot of cases in terms of what people are and aren't willing to stomach. So I only see that growing over the next year um, and more of these tools sort of coming out of the toolbox of these threat actors in trying to find the pain points and find the pressure points where they can really force uh, victim companies into a difficult position. I mean, Jen touched on reaching out to patients, right? Like what's next in that regard? I remember a couple of years ago where, you know, a hospital had ransom notes spitting out of a printer. That kind of feels tame versus what we're seeing now. So it's really going to be um, a challenge in organizations understanding that these things are going to be very personal and executives doing their best to shake it off um, is going to be paramount in the successful response to some of these more aggressive actors. Well, let's see if you can throw any other song references into your, <laughs> uh, into your answers. Look, it is it is it is challenging. I think we as practitioners are often feel like we're yelling into the wind when we tell our clients how hard it is to respond to these incidents and how challenging they are to organizations. I think folks think that they uh, are ready because they've done a few tabletops and then they learn very quickly uh, that that is not the case. In terms of uh, just a mention on um, uh, the more sophisticated, the APT groups, uh, Jen, starting with you, same question to Travis, though. Um, are you seeing uh, uptick in APT activity? Uh, and, and is that, now this is a whole other uh, seminar, uh, but just a quick note, uh, Jen, if you will, on seeing increased APT activity, is that changing the way you approach as a, as a lawyer in the space? So yes, we are seeing an increase in APT activity. And uh, yes, it does change how we approach it because the threat actor intelligence that we have on the APT groups, it tells us a lot about what we can expect and how bad the situation is. Um, knowing uh, as much as we can about the threat actor that we're dealing with is always going to be a part of what we're using to, to guide our clients through responding to the incident. But the APT matters are just so messy because they're in there. And sometimes it's really hard to know they're in there and then get them out. And they may be seeing everything that you're doing to try and get them out and evading and getting ahead of you. So all of a sudden, these events where maybe the scope of the investigation, if it wasn't an APT event, would be much more narrow. It's much broader because they're in there and you got to find them and you got to get them out. And sometimes you can find them, but then getting them out is a challenge, too. Travis, how about you? Exact same experience that Jen is having, you know, one um, a byproduct, I think, of the APT threat. And it's actually also a byproduct of the increased efforts to harass execs and their families is we are seeing more of a desire for companies to engage with law enforcement, um, especially, for example, in the scenario where you have threats to family members or to, uh, to pets of a family, there's a desire to get law enforcement involved to protect the execs and the family, even the, the, the general counsel or the chief information security officer, they all feel intense pressure there. We also see it um, on the APT side more because it is such a more challenging environment and it's no longer just nation states that have the capacity to do that given the, uh, the, the advances in technology. And so I think a byproduct of this is, whereas two, three years ago, um, almost, you know, the vast majority of, 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 of our clients did not want to talk to law enforcement. It actually is a serious conversation now. doesn't mean that every single one of them turns in and says yes, but it is an extremely serious conversation that we are having um, as a result of the increased sophistication and the APT uh, attacks. Evan, does the, the, does the, the, does the, uh, uh, your investigate, companies investigating APT activity, does that change how you're thinking about this from a comms or controlling comms standpoint? It does. Um, I mean, APT incidents are, are in a lot of ways always more complicated than your traditional ransomware where your hand is kind of getting forced from a comm standpoint. And then throw in the new SEC rules, which I know Chris will touch on later. Um, but the other thing that I'm seeing 
uh, from the the increased APT activity that Jan and Travis referenced, um, and sort of the steady drumbeat of these alerts from CISA, particularly focused on the critical infrastructure sector, is a desire to be prepared as best as possible from a lot of these operators. And, and critical infrastructure is such a broad category, right? Like we think water and railways, but it's really a lot more than that. But nobody wants to face a potentially devastating incident from an APT standpoint and then turn around and tell people they didn't have a plan in place to deal with it. Um, and I think the concern in these sectors is the evolution of APT behavior and where it may be going, because as we traditionally think about it with limited exceptions, it's been focused on intellectual property theft, sort of commercial opportunities and state espionage. But everybody's concern is when does APT and the traditional TTPs of ransomware groups start to cross over and geopolitics or any other factor drives APT actors to try to be disruptive and to reach a point where they no longer are just trying to sit there and watch, but are actually trying to be disruptive. And so organizations are thinking through, both from a security standpoint, how they can best prepare for that. But also from my perspective, from a communication standpoint, how do you explain that? How do you explain the sophistication of some of these actors, these nation state actors, and the challenges associated with trying to deal with them? Um, it's just a lot more complicated and nuanced than the financially motivated uh, criminal groups where you know exactly what they want, you know exactly what they're trying to do, you know exactly what their extortion tactics are going to be. This is kind of a new world. And, you know, when I talk to clients and folks in the industry and I say, you know, what's really keeping you up at night? It's a sort of mass detonation on the APT side, disrupting infrastructure for reasons that are unrelated to a particular company's objectives. So, really thinking through the scenarios an organization might face depending on its industry and doing the very best to prepare for that so you're not building the plane when you're flying it when sort of an unprecedented thing happens um, is critical and it's something that we're seeing a lot more demand for from our side we get lots of questions it's gonna be hard to hit all of them one of the questions about abt was you know do you think it makes sense to disconnect to make their communications more difficult uh if you identify an abt it, it, very interesting question and it, the best part about being a lawyer in cyber is you get to say it depends and maybe um uh, a lot of times uh uh yeah we want we want to watch uh we want to see what they're doing um um and when we do that intentionally but again it always depends i'm going to ask another topic that's coming up a lot about ransom payments um, and I'm happy to uh, make my opinion um, uh, clear. Um, I do not think this is something that should be regulated, uh, but uh, lots of questions in the um, um, audience is, uh, what's the trend? Are you seeing companies um, uh, not pay as much? Uh, uh, do you think um, uh, policy positions uh, might be implemented uh, to prohibit uh, payments? Let, let's start with uh, Jen, get your thoughts. Yep, so we are seeing a decline in clients paying ransoms. Um, last year, we had 16% of our ransomware clients pay the ransom. Uh, this year, Q1, we're at 9% of our ransomware clients paying the ransom. So we're still seeing payments happen, but more frequently, payment is not occurring on the ransomware events. How about you, Travis? Uh, we were also seeing that payments um, are not happening at the same percentage that they were last year. The reasons that we've seen that, I'll take number one, the amount of the demands are increasing. Um, substantially. And so, whereas before it might have been $50,000 and you could get out of it, it's now 500 or 5 million or 50 million that you're dealing with. Those numbers are much harder to deal with, not only because they are larger numbers, but number two, the SEC rule. For a lot of public companies, those numbers could be large enough that they end up having to not only disclose the incident, but potentially disclose the payment and the risks that come from that. Um, so we've we've seen um, circumstances change that I think are affecting the decision making in ways that in prior years there was more when you could do it largely um, in, in 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 the shadows um, would have made it so that it was a little bit more it was easier uh, to justify making the payment when you for example now are the director of a public company and you have fiduciary duties um, to the company, you have to think about how this is going to play itself out in that securities class action or that SEC investigation, whether to pay or not to pay or how much to pay and when. 
Well, I, I think of the man in the arena speech by Theodore Roosevelt. Um, uh, it's not the critic who counts. It's uh, the, the, the man or woman in the arena. I don't think this should be left to policymakers. I think people who deal with it uh, should be brought into the discussion um, because uh, those are the ones who really understand why they might be paying. Um, that's my uh, uh, public announcement. Um, uh, SEC rule. Lots of lots of focus there from Black Cat uh, pinging the, the SEC um, uh, to the to the to the broader disclosure rule and the 8K. Um, uh, Jennifer, Jen, um, talk about uh, that. Uh, what you're seeing uh, following the um, uh, SEC activity. Yeah, so the Black Cat instance, it shows that they are paying attention to uh, obligations U.S. organizations have and trying to leverage it against organizations. They just didn't read the effective date. Um, but but still, it's it's something to be aware of because that's a disclosure that's going to possibly out the organization that may still be trying to get their hands around the event. Um, materiality is the biggest question that our clients face, you know, whether or not there is an event that is material enough that's going to trigger the reporting. And it, the discussion isn't going to be the same for every single client. But the ramification is that there may be a public disclosure of an event that they still don't understand. Is it ongoing? How bad is it? Who's impacted? And it's going to, we talk about it with all of our clients, and I know everybody on this panel does it too, too early of a notification or too broad of a notification. What's the impact of that? What's the downside of that? Is there an upside to that? And the new SEC rule is just heightening that discussion that we're having with our clients because it's when you have other people know about the event earlier than you want them to, it makes it harder to continue to investigate the event. And Evan, from a PR perspective, it heightens the PR concerns that our clients have and the PR needs that our, cli that our clients have. But Travis, you know, in terms of, I, I, I feel like things I've seen, we, 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 we see some things that are a little bit curious in filings. Um, what are your thoughts uh, since the rule uh, and what you're seeing? So, you know, we, we, we also um, saw the black cat um, uh, notice and an effort to publish an incident to the SEC. That actually wasn't that new from our perspective because for a few years now, we have seen threats to go to regulators. It hasn't been the SEC, but typically it's the FTC, um, state AGs and others. They just, it, 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 or amorphous, we're going to go to law enforcement and, you know, rat you out. So we, we've seen that before. The SEC, obviously, with the new rule, is on the playing field now. And so it's now a new government agency that we're seeing them them go to. Um, like Jen said, materiality since the SEC rule has gone into effect is the question that everyone wants to talk about. Uh, we at Cooley, Michael Egan, Randy Sabet and I, um, and Dave Nevada, we're all working on a materiality playbook with clients. We're kind of helping them on the front end to put together a playbook so that they know how to make the materiality determination in the, you know, in the cyber framework, um, as opposed to in the financial, the pure financial framework. It's different. Um, the people that need to be involved are different. Um, the, you know, the, the CISO clearly needs to be involved, but the CISO is not the CFO, right? They, they don't necessarily get, they don't get to make that decision or to make that call. So we're trying to help our clients um, have an approach to it on the front end rather than developing it in the middle of an incident while the board and the C-suite is Googling or going to Edgar and looking at other 8Ks and trying to draw a line between them. Uh, we ourselves monitor every 8K that's filed um, with, with regard to a cyber incident. We see them all, we track them so that we're able to look at them for precedent. Um, so we're developing a precedent database that we can then use to help our clients when they have to make the determination to find what that needs to look like, as well as what the follow-up needs to look like, whether there's a communication strategy around it, whether we need to pre-notify other government agencies as well, uh, the extent to which we need to speed up the efforts to notify consumers. Um, there's just, and, and of course, all of this is happening in an environment where exactly like Jen said, is rare that we actually have reached the end of our forensic investigation to know what the actual landscape looks like. So it has definitely changed the game uh, on us and we're trying to help our clients get in front of it now a lot more. 
I mean, from a calm standpoint, all well said, Travis. When, uh, from a from a um, a calm standpoint, it seems like the content is is pretty lacking. What's your take? Are these AKs are they play, uh, replacing uh, comms? And and relatedly, if you could just a minute on as well as a lot of companies don't communicate very well um, uh, during uh, during these incidents. So how are you seeing this with the AK on the one hand getting out there really quickly and just companies not doing a great job of communicating? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question, Chris. I mean, I'll take the 8K piece first. Um, I think everybody on this panel knows that if you look at the substance of 8Ks that have been filed, even before the effective date of the rule, because everybody was kind of playing by that rule in the months leading up to it and then subsequent to it, 8Ks that are being being filed, that is not sufficient information for a number of critical stakeholders for victim companies. So we've certainly not reached a point where a business to business organization files an 8K, customer questions are coming in and they can just say, oh, go read the 8K. That's got everything you need because the 8K doesn't have indicators of compromise. The 8K doesn't have you know, a root cause analysis. The 8K doesn't have details on where the forensic investigation is. And to Jen and Travis's point, they're being filed before investigations are anywhere approaching being complete. Um, so they're almost taking the place of a short press release or a press statement. It may be the type of thing you would say to a consumer early in an incident, but as far as the sophisticated audiences that basically every organization deals with, whether they're business to business or business to consumer, they've got suppliers, they've got vendors, they've got partners, they've got people whose software is hooked into their software. So there's still a tremendous communications imperative that goes well beyond what would be in an 8K filing. And that I think, Chris, is where companies struggle and stumble. It's not thinking through the fact that that will not be a sufficient amount of information for organizations that are concerned about risks to their own networks, that are concerned about data that they've provided to a partner. And so I think where the, where the stumbling happens is a lack of understanding of how sophisticated this ecosystem has gotten, how used to these types of notifications a company's business stakeholders might be, and the associated demands that come with that. I mean, I, I, you, uh, it, Change Healthcare was mentioned. I can't even imagine the volume of questions that they've received from their partners and the level of sophistication that those questions entail. I mean, when you're dealing with the financial sector, we've all seen the questionnaires that come from all of the bulge bracket banks when anybody in their ecosystem is, ecosystem is affected by an incident. So I think there's sort of a hope and a prayer that if we just file this thing, we've checked that regulatory box and that's kind of the end of it. Whereas the 8K is really the start of the communications process now. And they're happening so early and they're happening almost in every case where the company's saying, we don't know if this is material or we don't expect this to be material. And that's just the start of the comms process. And people need to be thinking about, okay, what is going out the door 45 seconds after that 8K is filed? And who is intaking the questions that are going to come now that you've publicly disclosed an event? So the more that organizations can kind of put that muscle memory in place and those procedures in place and realize that comms in a cyber incident is the marathon, not a sprint, and the 8K is really the starting gun more than anything else, that's where organizations succeed. Um, rapid fire right back to you, but you only get 30 seconds on this question. Um, uh, 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 saying you're a victim versus being accountable and standing up straight about it, what, what's your advice? Yeah, I get that question a lot. I mean, it's true that every organization that faces a cyber incident, whether it's ransomware, APT, et cetera, is technically the victim of a crime. But in terms of how hard you lean into that, it's really dependent, in my uh, opinion, on how the attack took place. If you had an unpatched vulnerability for which a patch existed for several months and that was the root cause of the incident, playing the victim card is not going to help you. And so it really is that sort of language around victimhood, victim of a crime is, in my opinion, very dependent on how exactly an attack happened and what the ramifications are. Because if you've got millions of consumers with healthcare data exposed, for example, they're going to have a little bit less sympathy to you than if you were an organization with a very mature security program and a zero day vulnerability led an APT into your environment, you've been fighting them ever since. So it really is circumstance dependent. And I know a lot of organizations wanna play that card early, 
But if there's any element of sort of negligence involved, that's really going to backfire on the back end. We, we, I'm switching gears to governance, which is a really important topic, because I think we all would say as practitioners that that's a huge area um, and often um, uh, related to root cause. Uh, NIST 2.0 came out with a focus on governance. Jen, uh, you see more attention by management, board. Uh, what's different? Yeah, we're seeing a lot more effort being put into uh, determining exactly who the internal stakeholders are going to be to the incident response process. And it may be somebody who feels they should be a stakeholder, but should not be a stakeholder. Identifying who that person or who those people are and having conversations with them to cut that fluff out when you're experiencing an incident and say you, you actually don't belong at the table. Um, but there are expectations that need to be understood and identified before an event occurs so that those expectations can be met um, in a timely fashion, because there is going to be involvement that's needed by management, by boards. And uh, oftentimes we see organ organizations not realizing that involvement is necessary to the incident response process until they're in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of responding to an incident. So take the time to understand the internal framework and stakeholders before an event happens and work with them so everybody understands what to expect, who's responsible for what, and who's not going to be involved, who shouldn't know anything about the incident. Who should be kept out of the room? Who has the decision power? If there's a disagreement in what approach should be taken, who has the final call? We're seeing more organizations put the effort into having those conversations before they experience an incident. Well, that's similar to us too. Travis, what's your, what, what, what's your take? Uh, yes, we're seeing it more in public companies. Uh, to be honest, in the non-public companies, we haven't seen it as much of a focus on government governance, but certainly in the public companies, not really because of NIST 2.0, more so because of the SEC's new cyber rule um, is really motivating a lot of conversation about at the board level, for example, which committee of the board should be responsible for cyber? Um, should it be the audit committee? Should, should there be a separate committee created, a new cyber risk management? Um, committee uh, that is fundamentally taking that role and how often should they be briefed, um, you know, and kept apprised, not only in the event of an incident, but in advance um, and, and really thinking about their responsibility, not just uh, to manage an incident, but also to look at the resources that are invested in information security, looking at the insurance, the cyber insurance to making to make sure that it is sufficient for the threats that they face, looking at the personnel that are handling information security, looking at the um, uh, management's uh, role as well in overseeing it. So uh, we are seeing a lot more when it comes to governance, primarily from the uh, the SEC rule. And of course, there's also the issues around uh, CISO risk um, now with the, uh, the SolarWinds action. I think we have a bilateral problem. We've got CISOs who aren't adequately reporting to the board in a way that gives the board enough information to understand what the risk is. And on the other hand, you have boards who aren't educated enough to ask the right questions. I think that's a big problem and a big disconnect. Evan, uh, what, 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 from, from a comm standpoint, what, what are your thoughts there? Do you see more focus on that topic? Yeah, really a tremendous amount of scrutiny on that, Chris. And I think what it comes... I agree with you completely to start with, that it is a bilateral issue. I think work is being done to try to address the board side of it. Um, you know, we're increasingly seeing clients sending one or two members of the board to, you know, a Harvard continuing education class for two weeks to at least get smart enough to know the questions they should ask. And then that board member is in the quarterly tabletops. So that's a place where at least some work is being done to address it. The challenge, I think, is... The CISO's role as a communicator has changed so dramatically over the last few years, and that's not necessarily a skill set that CISOs have been asked to develop through their careers. So you've got people coming up through information security and risk departments, and their job was highly technical. Hands on keyboard, eyes on glass, how do we protect this organization? And then they get to the highest level of that, and all of a sudden, they're talking to the audit committee on a quarterly basis. They're trying to help people understand risk mitigation, even more importantly, risk tolerance. I think CISOs really struggle because of the pressure that's put on that role. I think it's one of the hardest jobs in any organization, particularly a publicly traded one, to articulate that there is a certain amount of risk that we are tolerating by the following practices that we're undertaking and by the following things we're allowing the business to do. Being able to articulate that in an informed way and in a way that a board and honestly other members of the C-suite can grasp is incredibly challenging. 
And so all of a sudden, CISOs are trying on the fly to develop a new skill set that they've never been asked to do before. And I think it puts them in a really uncomfortable position and almost in a lot of ways an unfair position. And so that's sort of the next step. We're upskilling the board, but upskilling CISOs and getting them comfortable with having honest conversations about a security maturity program, about risk tolerance, about risk mitigation is the next step. And I think it's a place we're going to see organizations investing more and more. Otherwise, you're going to get to an incident and the board and the CISO are speaking completely different languages and nobody really understood that something was possible because those audiences have been talking past each other. Sometimes there's a perception that the lawyers are trying to, you know, sort of get in the way of that conveying more detail. I mean, Jen, uh, are you advising CISOs to present more detail, present risk differently? Uh, how are you seeing it? Um, so, and just just a minute, apologies yeah. on that. No worries. So I'm kind of going to echo what Evan said. When working with CISOs, we're actually making them wear a legal hat as well. And what we're finding is that there's a lot of good dialogue that happens with the board and with management when uh, law is discussed, penalties and ramifications are discussed, and war stories are discussed. There are lots of media reports out there about organizations and in industry sector, various industry sectors. You can find someone, you can find several organizations that are close enough to you in profile and find a story about them having an event. And when you can start sharing stories like that with management, with the board, we're seeing just more successful conversations happen, but CISOs are wearing more and more of a legal hat. Um, and from a self-preservation perspective, we are absolutely not getting in the way of good conversations happening. <laughs> Travis, you're, you're, no, very, Travis, your thoughts on that and is, uh, are, are CISOs coming to you really concerned? How are you advising CISOs? Yes, um, I think Evan and Jen hit the nail on the head. Um, we actually filed an amicus brief in the SEC's action against uh, Tim, Tim Brown, CISO, uh, for, um, for SolarWinds on behalf of, I think, 30 um, former uh, is chief information um, uh, security officers. Um, and uh, the, in that amicus brief, we actually highlighted how the, the importance of the role of the, the CISO. And I actually want to read a sentence from it because I think it really hits and crystallizes what Evan and Jen said. We were describing the challenges of being a CISO in today's environment. They not only have to serve as engineers safeguarding IT infrastructure, they're also serving as intelligence officers, identifying and mitigating new vulnerabilities. They're serving as compliance experts, navigating reg regulation. They're serving as advisors, educating organizational leadership. And when a cyber incident takes place, they serve as emergency responders uh, as well. Not They, they feel in a, a hugely vulnerable position because if they're held individually liable for decisions that they can't make, they don't get to decide when to disclose and when and what to disclose. They are just one individual on behalf of the organization. So yes, they're worried about liability. Of course, we are uh, their individual liability. We represent the company. We don't represent the individual. And so that um, imposes a little bit of a challenge there. But yes, no doubt, um, the, the landscape and the vulnerability for CISOs since the SEC rulemaking has changed dramatically. Well, we got a question uh, asking whether uh, we thought uh, uh, Joe uh, Sullivan was treated uh, fairly. Um, I, uh, I, I do not think he was, and you'll have to call me if you want to know why. Uh, Bruce, you're here, um, and so I think that means we're done. Um, uh, so I will turn it back over to you. But first, I want to just thank this panel, which was awesome. Of course, as always, every year, we didn't get enough time to hit all the topics, but this was a lot. Thank of you to the panel, Jen, Travis, Evan, fantastic job. And Chris, really nice job moderating today and getting us off to such a great start. All right. So we will be right back with our next